interesting track, and this is also another interesting track. So obviously, this is the most interesting track. I'm glad you sniffed it out. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to do before we get started is just do a little uh, brief framing of, of this panel. It's really kind of a mini workshop. It is a panel, but it's a little mini workshop, I've put it, where we're, we're supposed to kind of answer a question. Uh, and that is, how is UVA uniquely positioned to make a significant impact in research at the intersection of data science and digital communities? Uh, there are two components to that. So there's an intellectual one, is like how do these fields overlap, and what are the productive areas of overlap, but also it's an organizational one, uh, where the devils are in the details of how you actually get people to talk right in this particular area. And so to lead us in this, what I call a mini workshop, we've invited two directors of UVA's two major digital humanities centers, both of which are nationally recognized and pretty historically deep, going back to the early uh, 1990s and the early aughts. Um, and first we have Worthy Martin, Professor of Computer Science, Director of the Institute for Advanced Technologies and the Humanities, which you may have heard called IAM. And we have Allison Booth, Professor of English, and Academic Director of the Scholar Side. So Worthy and Allison will each spend 10 minutes uh, presenting their perspectives and experience and research as directors of these units related to the question I've just described, but more broadly just to the intersection of PH and data science. And after both speak, um, we will respond to questions from you all. Um, I may have some questions as well. Uh, and after that, we're going to open them more broadly to a, a conversation about the future of digital advantages and data science at the University of Virginia at both of those levels. So with that, I'll begin with Worthy and um, yeah. more or less 10 minutes. Okay. So uh, thanks for being here. So, Beautiful sunny day coming in on this stuff. So, um, well, I was going to kind of start out and say digital humanities has sometimes kind of been referred to as as the intersection between humanities and data science before people were not using data science as a phrase too much. But uh, so it's already an intersection in that way. Um, but uh, what I would like to say is I've, I've been looking for a phrase that's uh, 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 somewhat larger in scope, uh, and I've kind of uh, rather pedantic term of uh, computationally mediated scholarship or research. And uh, and to me that encompasses uh, almost all the working sessions like this that Data Palooza is doing today where data science is trying to have an intersection and see how we can have a, a productive intersection with many, many different disciplines. And uh, so I think that the, a lot of the things that we would talk about about how data science and digital humanities uh, productively collaborate uh, are actually true uh, across many of the other disciplines, so that there are many of these things that are not uh, discipline specific. And I think humanities per se is, uh, is to be read very, very large. Uh, my, the Institute for Advanced Technology and Humanities uh, was originally created to be at the provost level, so it's Penn University. And uh, part of the idea there is that the kind of things that might constitute humanistic scholarship are actually going on in all across the university. We had several people from architecture here today and uh, had a couple of uh, faculty in architecture uh, as uh, fellows at the institute. So but the one thing about the computation mediated uh, scholarship is it uh, seems in most cases to still be inherently a collaborative effort. It very rarely is the case that anybody can do the entire scope of things that one needs to bring together. And, and here I, I want to mention that I think that that is being well beyond just the kind of skills you might think of needing to get a, 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 a digital tool to operate on some data. Uh, there's actually the intellectual side of that, of what, what is uh, needed, what's in the uh, actual scholarship, uh, and thinking through uh, that representational issue for uh, working in the uh, computation mediated stuff. And so that, that kind of notion of collaboration where people really deep, deeply engage in uh, the research questions that both uh, both contribute intellectually, all contribute intellectually to is a trick. And I think that there is a, a it's a very hard thing to do successfully, I think. Uh, it's a hard thing uh, intellectually for groups to really feel like they uh, do contribute and, and be in the, the settings so that people uh, understand how they can contribute and come together is an important uh, kind of interpersonal sort of reaction. Uh, it's also uh, structurally a problem, and this is a place where I think that the, the creation of the data science, the School of Data Sciences, is maybe going to open some possibilities for the university administration to be thinking, thank you, Phil, the university to be thinking a little bit more broadly about uh, 
was kind of administrative things, structural things that go on with it. And to me, part of that is uh, how you have the people available within the university so that they can join into a collaboration. And these things, the collaborations are uh, of various lengths of term, so sometimes they may be uh, six months, maybe two years, uh, maybe uh, ten years. So the collaboration goes over long periods of time. It also varies in terms of intensity, how much of uh, one's personal effort one's, uh, is, is involved in it. And uh, the teams have a, a, a lot of variances to, at, at the current time how much time, how much of my overall effort is going into that collaboration. And, and having people available uh, that uh, to join into that kind of collaboration is a tricky administrative thing. So if, if a project wants to get started and you can't get a collaboration going until you have that NSF or NEH proposal funded and the money is there, uh, you're going to be in deep trouble because uh, those people are going to be very hard to find at that amount of time and you'll probably just get them hired when the grants are over. So anyway, so I think that there's uh, things that we should be thinking about here that are, are I think, true about cross-computation mediated scholarship of lots of varieties, and we can think about what the specifics are that might be more uh, tuned to the humanities side, um, and then we can think about how that comes into to making collaborations. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Oh. Well, and speaking of a collaboration, Worthy Martin has been a collaborator, actually a guide to my own digital project. So um, I uh, migrated into doing digital humanities mid-career after I'd gotten uh, promoted. And um, my definition of digital humanities is actually not dissimilar to Worthy's, I would say. Um, and it's, it's I'm just publishing something in a, in a co-authored piece that's sort of saying there is no definition of digital humanities. Uh, but advanced humanities research that uses and reflects upon computational methods. And I would stop there, except that I've had some pushback with people who don't like the word computational, because not all digital humanities considers itself to be computational in the big sort of the notion of big data, so digital tools. So reflecting upon the computational methods and digital tools. Um, and definitely what Worthy says, it's collaboration. And it's inherently interdisciplinary um, in the sense that it is a collaboration. There's very, very few digital humanists can sit at their own laptop and churn out anything um, that looks great and has substance. If, they, if it looks like they're doing it from their own laptop, that's a kind of illusion, because even if they know how to design the software themselves, there, there are people who went before them who created the computer. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a deep and long and broad uh, collaboration inherent in digital humanities. And I mention that because a lot of humanists have a, an illusion about doing it on their own. So humanists are supposed to go home and write a book by themselves, and they have to like time by themselves. Um, and one of the reasons I like digital humanities is it's much more social and much more uh, interactive. Um, so the interdisciplinarity has been also just hugely transformative for me. And I would add, not all definitions of digital humanities would add this. I would say um, that it, digital humanities promotes public access and humanistic knowledge and understanding. It may seem obvious, but the spirit of public access uh, is, is truly widespread um, within digital humanities. Very few people want your data to be closed and hidden. Um, and you know, the principles that, um, uh, sorry, Kath, was, Victoria Stodden was talking about in the keynote uh, about reproducibility and replicability because you need to share your data and your process seem to me not news in digital humanities. Um, and, and digital humanities partly because there's much less money involved. You, you know, from the point of view of people in English departments, digital humanities have all this money and they're taking it away from the humanities. If only there were all these NEH uh, grants to apply for, if only we were all funded with millions of dollars, um, but there's very little money at stake in digital humanities, alas. <laughs> Um, so uh, I think the open access spirit and the idea that your GitHub is always, you know, widely, you know, you, you publish things before they're done um, is, is partly, I think, because there, there are no uh, large-scale NSF grants usually at stake. So, so I'm an English professor. My digital project 
is a long-standing collaboration, both in the Scholars Lab, which um, Bethany Nowitzki founded in 2006, and in IF. Um, and I, it's based on a relatively small bibliography of printed books. So I am in the literary digital humanities. It's also feminist digital humanities, and I've hosted a couple of conferences here. Very interesting um, strain within digital humanities, feminist digital humanities. Um, and so, since about 2003, I decided I ally with Digital Humanities. Uh, I've been co-directing the Scholars Lab since 2016. Um, some of the staff inside the Scholars Lab do not say they do Digital Humanities. There are GI two GIS specialists, two people who work on VR and AR. Um, they, they, these are the spatial tech guys, and they don't you know, and I don't mind that they don't say they do digital humanities. It's a, it's a nomenclature difference. Um, cultural heritage informatics, so informatics is another, another word for it. The nomenclature seems to me not to really matter. It will change over time. Digital humanities is a fairly new term, was computing in the humanities. And I like to say, you know, in 2030, someone will say, oh, isn't it quaint? They called it digital humanities before. Well, and what's going to happen in the, in the 21st century? We don't know. So I'm not attached to the nomenclature. I do like the idea that digital humanities is pan-university. By, by humanities, we mean qualitative and interpretive. So social scientists, we've had engineers um, come to our makerspace. We work with. Um, uh, there's been an economics student who was a Praxis Fellow, so we, we certainly, and in a way you might say, well, I, I have two provocative things to say. Is there such a thing as data science? But then are we all data scientists now, since we're all really working with a lot of data? My data might be rather small, but um, I was listening to the environmental scientists talking about munching their data and cleaning data on 9,000 persons 1,270 books, 14,000 short biographies in my project. It's not, it's not going to, it's not 50,000 novels in the Google Books project, but it's plenty of data to try to clean. So, two more paragraphs essentially. Start with some concerns. I'm someone doing DH and interested in how it can work with data science. Um, I, uh, I mentioned that Victoria Stodden highlights for me the ideal of open access and linked voted open data that's already prevailing in DH, but it's not the norm yet in data science, as I gathered from her talk. Obviously, the humanities, like sciences, have been proprietary. We certainly have had our intellectual property fights in, inside, the di uh, digital inside digital humanities, too. In both data science and digital humanities, I'm afraid that data gathering is not regarded as higher level work. And you hear digital humanists constantly talking about it's theorizing all the way down. Whatever everyone is doing is part of the scholarship. Do not separate the, the hand work from the mind work. But in DH, many have been working, uh, you know, we work on met metadata standards for the data we curate. Um, and. It sounds, for example, from overhearing the, the session this morning, that environmental science hasn't quite addressed that kind of question that a lot of digital humanists would be thinking about, about ontologies. I'm interested in some anxiety about digital humanities being subdivided into more objective, big, scientific sets. So even within digital humanities, you're hearing people going into cultural analytics or computational humanities separating themselves from digital humanities, which has tended to include fuzzy thinking English professors. Um, even some specialists in Victorian literature and culture are preferring the term data. So digital humanities is to something, cultish or something. So the conference that I'm hosting on November 15th, 16th here is called Victorian Data. I'm perfectly fine with that, I, I, uh, but I'm noticing a switch from thinking about digital humanities to thinking about data. Um, all research of, researchers, of course, deal with data, and the potential of larger sets of data impinges on all research, um, but the slippage between data and DH is not trivial. It seems to me, what I don't want to see happen, is that data edges out digital in institutional commitments. 
I think that you can imagine data threatening to mute humanities into either curricular add-ons of engineering schools, as in classes on ethics or society, or an undergraduate luxury. So that's my concern. I'm not actually concerned at the University of Virginia. I'm seeing the opportunities. I've listened to the way this school of data science is talking. So this school of data science is at the forefront with initiatives at other major research universities. There's a special opportunity at UVA because we have this truly pan-university, amazing history in digital humanities. We're really, we're often cited as originators in this, as at the front. So why not have the School of Data Science work with the digital humanities here? Uh, all of our top-ranked arts and sciences departments are in the humanities. English is one of the you know, top 10. You know. So it's, it's, in other words, at UVA, data science can also mean data, arts, and humanities. And I think we could call it DASH or something. You know, we've got, everyone's working with these things. Um, many of the leaders in digital humanities today got their, their training here. Um, I just helped co-lead the humanities informatics lab. Um, we got a new DHS graduate certificate. There's a lot going on, and I think we can really build on that. And just to, to wind up, I, I've had the privilege of a capstone project that uh, Raf Alvarado mentored. Three um, master students in the Data Science Institute worked on the data in my project. And it was, there was a cultural divide. They had not been humanities majors. They didn't quite know the British women, the historical women I was talking about. But, and I didn't quite understand what they were doing with language models on my data. But it was worthwhile. And I really do see that as constructive. And I really think that actually the students who specialized in STEM, uh, uh, my colleague at UCLA is saying that the STEM students want to do digital humanities because there's meaning over the humanities. <laughs> you know, they feel like they didn't have to leave behind the things that made life meaningful um, to do this. So I see a lot of real strong potential and I would love to be part of collaboratories with uh, Worthy and with Raf and all the people sitting in this room to do data and digital humanities. Yeah. You have a little time, yeah. I, I, I think I took more. No, you're fine. We're, we're well with it. His word, he spoke very quickly, actually. So you can add on if you'd like. Well, I just wanted to follow up on uh, two things that were in what Allison said. I think one of the places uh, you mentioned the importance of uh, accessibility, and I want to broaden that a little bit to the dissemination of the scholarly results, the scholarly objects that, that one produces through their research and scholarship. Uh, and I think there is a, a, a way in which, uh, for the humanities, and I, again, I'm a computer scientist, so I'm speaking a little bit third-hand, but that for the computer science, uh, for the humanist, uh, there is something where the actual production of what we might think of from the computer science side or from the data science side as the final dissemination, just that final paper that gets it out there, is actually tied up deeply in the scholarship. To say the scholarship actually progresses with the way in which the exposition and the dissemination of the scholarly idea uh, is presented. And so that, that notion that the scholarship is being built as you do something that might otherwise look from a later time period is, oh, well, that was just the way you, you said, that was the paper you sent out. That was the monograph you printed. But producing that, actually creating uh, those things that actually is part of the scholarship. And, and I think from a computer science side, uh, speaking for myself, we, uh, I kind of compartmentalize things a little bit more. Well, we'll go get the, the grant, we'll do the research, and then we'll write the papers, right? And so the writing of the papers seems like it's a, a, a mere documentation of what we did in our research, and the real research happened at different time. And I think that is an aspect that it does feel different uh, between uh, a disciplinary kind of way. Uh, and so that, that notion of how that gets tied up in the actual development uh, again, makes it a little bit tricky in some of the projects if the, if the thinking about what one is doing is actually progressing uh, as you're doing the scholarship, then it, it makes some, some kind of things a little bit tricky in terms of uh, uh, the data science side. Um, the other is that you, you mentioned somewhere along the way that humanists like to think of themselves as going off and being by themselves and, and, and that they produce it. And, and uh, from, uh, again, from outside, there, there's kind of a negative aspect of that, isn't that to say is that many of the scholars don't uh, acknowledge how much uh, intellectual contribution they have gotten all the way along the way uh, from various kinds of people, just as simple things as the reference desk at the library, but, but, uh, but that even is, a, is an intellectual contribution. Some of the sciences feel like they uh, tend to acknowledge that a little bit more, and most of the 
project site in the computer science department, nobody thinks they would actually do them if they hadn't had those really good couple of graduate students who are in there. They understand the, the strong collaboration, the contribution that those graduate students made. And so that idea of, of, of being able to, across the collaboration, be able to acknowledge the intellectual contribution of all the members, I think, is still an important thing for all of us. So I'm going to hold up your questions, but I just wanted to say something about Allison's project. I think that the students got as much about learn, out of learning about Lola Montes <laughs> and being interested in that. I mean, they actually were they were really interested in her as a person, mm -hmm. as, as you did in word embedding. You know, some of the things they were doing with your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, well, I knew I was interested in word embedding, and they, they never heard of Lola Montes. That's before, exactly so. right. <laughs> By the way, just as a teaser, Lola Montes was also known as a Spanish dancer, and she was Irish. <laughs> and presumably no one who ever talked to her noticed she wasn't speaking Spanish. There's a movie about it. Yes. Anyway, um, so what I'd like to do now is a lot of, a lot of things we've talked about here. So open up the questions to you all, and I'm just going to ask that when you ask a question, introduce yourself with your name and your sort of departmental or disciplinary affiliation. We'll do that for, I think, around 10 minutes. And then uh, the idea is, and I may have, some, I, I get to ask some questions, actually. And then we all go to this more broad question of collaboration, future thinking, that kind of thing. So, um, what do you got? Ron Hutchins, uh, VP for IT here at UGA. Allison, you mentioned STEM students interested now in digital humanities. Uh, it, it appears to me that there's a lot more interest from our scientifically based students in storytelling. Is that the aspect you're seeing, or how are you seeing this? Part, partly, but um, uh, it's, it's that my colleague, Miriam Posner, who runs a minor in digital humanities at UCLA, which is very strong in digital humanities, uh, noticed that it wasn't the English students and the history students who were doing taking the minor. It was the engineering students and you know the political science. There's a few, you know, I was just statistics, cognitive science, sociology. You know, the students came from these fields to do the DH minor at UCLA. Now, I, I assume that that's not unique to UCLA. Um, currently, with our DH certificate, it's a graduate certificate, we are not finding, we, we have one person from nursing. We have a lot of people from architectural history and architecture and um, uh, art history and things like that. But, but, it, but it still is more humanist doing DH at the graduate level. But this is, this is a perception that undergraduates, you know, they may have business, business majors, but they want the the skills you get with digital humanities, but also, you know, there's a way of thinking about humanist material with with data and with the skills they already have or the skills they might learn. So, so I mean, in a cr crude way, I don't, having many computer science advisees as undergraduates, the number of students who double major, double majoring is pretty widespread versus the number of students who double major uh, in computer science is very, very high. Uh, and most of those double majors, it's not like you're double major in computer science and electrical engineering or computer science and material science or something like that. It's computer science and history, it's computer science and French, things like that. That has some, a little bit to do with the kind of student body we have here, which is uh, one that very much appreciates that kind of thing. Uh, I don't think the undergraduates would um, verbalize an interest in storytelling in the way that your question does it. I think inherently they are, that does, that is a, is a, a pretty much a driver for them, that they actually know that kind of in their way of acting, <laughs> way of approaching things, but they wouldn't be able to verbalize it that way, I don't think. Um, we have faculty fellows coming to the uh, institute for their uh, fellows projects, and they often bring students with them, and quite a few times the humanities faculty, the students they bring, is actually a STEM student who had decided to double majoring and found out about the project through their course in, in the humanities things. So. So it's, a, it's an interesting kind of mix of students coming in. And so. but, but you're right, narrative really is pervading. You know, there's narrative medicine, there's narrative in all sorts of fields. Yeah, that might be an interesting question. Uh, can I yeah, follow ahead. up on that? So sure. Introduce Travis. yourself first. Though. My name is Travis Hyde. I'm the program director of the Link Lab. Um, we're a large group in uh, school of engineering, and we're very interdisciplinary uh, in what we study. It's the nature of the technology. So my question kind of comes from that because we're developing critical in our space. Following on to what Ron was talking about and your reflections of what types of students you see coming to these certificate and graduate level programs, do you see the curriculum needing to change or the kind of pedagogy of what you're doing needing to change based on that background that's influxing into the program? 
Um, so when you have a STEM-based person that's coming to maybe learn the humanities side of how they communicate their work or the reflection of their work in humanities, by a humanities person coming in, mm -hmm. maybe getting that digital side applied to the study. Does that create a need for different curriculum? Ideally, you could imagine uh, courses that, you know, where everyone's learning from each other. So the, the weirdness of the way you think could be articulated across the classroom. You know, so what? You don't know, get, you know, so, but, but in fact, I mean, I'm not saying this is how it should be, but in fact, I have not had that experience. Um, I've only taught DH, introduction to DH or introduction to literary DH courses to people who are in the humanities. So I don't know. I would imagine that you really would start from a different set of premises. Raph has a lot of experience teaching, you know, I think people from humanities take your courses, don't they? Yes. Okay. So do you feel like you need to change the curriculum for them? But you're offering new courses. You're, you're offering mostly courses that haven't been offered before. So you're changing the curriculum by the way the courses you actually offer. Yeah, I think my courses are all by definition changes in the curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it has, it, and it has nothing to do with digital the in terms of the right. format yeah. content. I have yeah. to like it's almost like a mini curriculum in a course. And so, anyways, we can go into that. Speaking from a computer science side, just follow up on that. Um, I think there's a, a, a very uh, strong need for it because uh, that it's actually looking at it from the humanities side. So we have the English major who is actually like to dive in as an undergraduate, dive into projects and, and wants to actually uh, know more about the underlying uh, information architecture issues. Uh, what, what do we have to tell them to, to do to, to get prepared to do that? Well, take. 1110, then 2150, then 21, and you, we, we give them a, a sequence of four courses where they get to the topic that might be of interest. So that, that idea of how, how you, uh, I don't think the computer science department has a good idea about how to create courses right. that come out at the right level that are not for their majors, but are crucial to, to that kind of thing. And so, and then, then there's just the staffing of those courses that they're not for our major, whose responsibility are we have faculty that are supposed to be doing that. Here's a place where bridging across um, uh, cluster hires and, and interdepartmental hires can be important, but thinking about that kind of position, if uh, they can do that class, and if that's, a, that's a, a valued class from both directions, it's all very, very tricky. And so I think how to offer that is, is a little tricky. I think that there's a lot of change also going on in the curriculum, um, not, not in the way that the arts and sciences is doing the new curriculum, but in the individual faculty, how many people in their individual humanities oriented classes are using technology, uh, coming to the library and, and having the library as a program where they uh, do extra things with librarians to, to look into the underlying uh, data resources. Uh, so there is a lot of stuff going on in the curriculum in the sense of new course, a little bit more like the kind of classes that RAF teaches uh, are, are doing this. And I think there's a, a lot of things that that's coming in, those classes are just building it in. And it's a way in which digital humanities might finally not be a topic in the sense that, well, everybody does some digital component on, on this part here, and, and so they're not separated out that way. But I saw but you, you probably do need to offer something like statistics for humanists. Yes, that would be a good one. So Eric, we have one, I think have time for one more question. Do you have a question? Sure. And then we'll move on to the more broader. Okay, it was very, and it may prompt a little bit of that as well. So Eric Field, uh, architecture. Um, so one of the things that I'm seeing, sort of speaking to new opportunities of building from the ground up, new curriculum, this kind of thing, Sort of where do we go with data and digital humanities? One of the most fundamental questions that I would sort of have, as well as ask and propose, is what is the actual definition of data within this world? In engineering or in, in many other areas of sciences, your concept of data is fairly well understood, right? You know, you'd be like, oh yeah, that's my data, that's my data, that's my data. Right. Right. Everyone thinks they have data. Yeah, and there are lots of different versions of that. But in, in digital humanities, that's much less, or in the humanities, I should say, in general, that's much less well construed. And I wonder what some of the opportunities might be there in terms of looking for new opportunities, new directions within the humanities space. But I know both of you probably know Beth Mitchell and her work. Right? Right. And so sort of thinking about it partially from that perspective, most of you here probably can have it. So to me, that's one of the places where the fundamental collaborative effort is needed at the intellectual level. That, that's an intellectual question. Uh, it, it finally has, uh, you know, 
implications for what you actually build, what kind of technology you use, and so forth. But there's an intellectual thing that goes on regardless of how it gets implemented as to what counts, what are you going to be able to do that. And so I think this is a place where uh, you say that the data is understood in the other places. I think it's, it's more understood in the sciences that people think that they understand there's phenomena and then there are sensing of the phenomena and there are representations of that sensing and they understand that there's these transformations of what's going on and then what we're dealing with out here is our abstraction of that. And I think that that, that kind of um, acknowledgement of that kind of process in, in moving the information through is a little less a little less uh, explicitly talked about in the humanities, but is necessary to. But every field in the humanities has actually had large scale projects, which when you look at them now, look a whole lot like data science of sorts. So, you know, any kind of philology, any kind of linguistics, any kind of effort to write a dictionary has got, you know, these sort of various ways in which you have units and then this, you know how, how, to, how to stem them and you know so they're there and the ontology discussion that goes on in digital humanities is really just sort of drawing on long-standing efforts to have standards you know in landscape architecture you have to have some metadata that people agree on right and so the text encoding initiative has really been transformative um, and of course it's very baroque because Hard to agree. I'm not you say broke? No. <laughs> <laughs> I broke. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, but sorry, sorry, I'm blowing your thing. Uh, but this this is a place where when uh, Alison Pivot earlier used the phrase computational methods, and the, and the question is is when you talk about trying to build a dictionary and you start thinking through exactly how you're going to be categorizing things, is that computational method, or is that just an intellectual method that you need? And, I, and so I, I tend to think that. People think, well, we're about to go and put this in a database, so what we're intellectually thinking about in terms of this must be a computational method. When in fact it's not. It's the intellectual method of trying to organize your 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 field, what, what you're doing in your topic. And then you're having to think of how you represent it in one particular implementation. And so that notion of whether it's a computational method or it's just a method of research and scholarship and it has a computational aspect to it, I think is a, is a nuance we need to keep in mind. So um, Eric asked my question. But you, and it, uh, so it gives me an opportunity actually to make an observation, which I would like to use as a transition to the next part of this conversation. Uh, if I can quote Winston Churchill, the, the, um, we have two countries here divided by a common language. Um, everyone's using the word data, and I can tell you just straight up that you guys mean it in completely different senses. Uh, and there, there are two senses. Uh, each and every one of us. Where, no, actually, <laughs> in my experience, are, and they're, they're related, obviously, and this is the intellectual, I think, challenge and what makes the ferment and, the, and, the, and the, uh, this, this, this proposition so interesting, I think, to all of us and to me. But one definition of the data is that which is the given, right? It's like, you know, the, 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 the Latin term of that which is given, yeah. that from which you begin your research. And all scientific and human thinking begins with some notion of primary source material that is the foundation of all of your work. Added with, uh, you know, intellectual analytical, uh, you know, what Aristotle called the analytics, onto that. In data science, data means a table of data with features and observations. It's, a, it's just a table, and it's what Foucault points out as being invented in the order of things. It's a specific invention in the West that occurs at a particular period of time, which drives all kinds of stuff uh, from the military, you know, to to medicine, right? And those two definitions obviously are, are inadequate because everyone there's a lot of space between those. And I think that's really where all the interesting stuff is, is happening. That's an intellectual problem, and there's a, an organizational problem that goes along with that because we all have investments in these particular ways of representing the world. So what I like to do then is just, that, that's just my observation. Um, it actually doesn't help anything. It just simply lays out <laughs> that we have like these two countries, I think, and there's this interesting borderland, if you will, called digital humanities, where people set up shop and they're reviled by both sides in some manners. Or, um, so I'd but, like to but, hope but, you but, can but, qualify this. Okay. Yeah, let me go ahead and let you qualify that and then go to the questions. Well, just uh, it's, it's surprisingly early. You know, I think Foucault's history is always fascinating and a lot often wrong. So, well, <laughs> well but, but for example, in the later 19th century, you have people creating prosopographies based on classical texts, and it's, it's tabular. I mean, it's basically... Well, that's the point. Is yeah. that the table, you see, in, in Roman times, you don't have tables. No, no, of course not. The Tibetans don't have tables. Right. right. No, so there you, has to be an endemic sometimes. You get tables not. with the Medicis in, in capitalism in, in Italy. And but it's not invented by the Navy in, in Britain. 
written or something like that. Exactly. It's just it prob it prob it People just always explain it as somehow you know, capitalism, and I just it, think it's much it more complicated. It propagates as a representational that. form, yeah. and then it becomes dominant to the point that now, if you take data, a data science class like in R, you know, as the language you're using, you will begin with this definition of data, tidy data. And tidy data is one observation per, per row and a whole bunch of features. And that's that's your that's what your that's what your T loss is. Right? You want everything to get into that form. Mm -hmm. Once it's in that form, then you can start working. But we know as humanists, like, mm -hmm. man, there's a whole genealogy to that, first of all, to that idea, but also to the work of getting the data into that form. Because when you talk about that, you're talking about this what, what Worthy was talking about, this sort of biography of all these transformations that can we all talk about data writing when it's taking up eighty percent of data science anyway, and that's just a way of talking about this. But anyway, oh, um, I think that's a fascinating question. We could have a whole, I think we should have a course on that topic. Um, but I'm not open I am teaching a course called Big Data, Biographical Data, as a pavilion seminar next fall. Based well, on the Humanities Informatics, Human Machine Intelligence Working Group. And I was just so excited about this work. I um, love that, that topic. Um, big, big Data, Biographical Data. So anyways, let's open up questions to this, to this big problem, how we actually build a, a real nation state within the same time. Football and data science. So, um, first of all, having lived in two countries, <laughs> separated by a common language, about half my life in each other. Yeah, there's, there's certainly things to be done together that's going to work out. This, this is a big picture question. I mean, what does both of you, from the perspective of Greg, what does success look like in five years? You have this school established, uh, you know, clearly it'll be a, a strong involvement at the age. What would your yeah, it could be from your own personal perspective but, or broader. Yeah, what does it look what, what will we see? What was um, Well, I mean, I kind of a. Simplified answer to that would be to come back to these collaborative things. It would be evidence of, of how uh, we have organizational mechanisms. That support the kind of collaborations that we think are that I've been trying to describe are important in, in the computation mediated scholarship, and uh, and the, the community itself. This is not, I, I mean, the way in which uh, the faculty and students interact, and and people like the staff, the libraries of interact, uh, understand that uh, better understand that intellectual activity of coming together on such uh, scholarly endeavors. All way too vague. I mean, we're trying to come back if we need. If you're asking me what table do we need to see in five years to know what success is, I'll walk on that. I don't know exactly what we list out as the measurements for this, but the, the notion that we can look around and we see a vibrant community where people uh, have inspiration to have projects and have have ways to come bring a team together to actually uh, realize that project, where some aspect may be people that are coming out of data science, maybe people coming out of the English department, maybe people. Architecture that come together on these projects. People, faculty, graduate students, otherwise considered to be staff people, that those kind of things can come together. And I think that that, that sort of thing. Well, I agree with that. Yeah. I, I guess what I, that's, you know, I think that's right. That's sort of a process outcome in a sense. What I, I'm kind of interested in is like a research outcome yeah. that would point to the, a, a, real, you know, a real success. It, it, it was something. You know, it doesn't have to be discovered necessarily, but something, you know, in my own world, I can think of, you know, cure for cancer or a mm -hmm. uh, human genome uh, being resolved, you know, that, but, but it's that kind of thing, you know, it's, it's really a, something a bit more direct than uh, a process or something like that. Well, I wouldn't dismiss what Worthy was saying as just process, because I, I think part of what we produce in digital humanities is people. Um, we're we're building viable careers that are, and it's not vocational training, you know, it's not just practical, but people who can, with a PhD, find a place to do research and teaching, uh, at either as a tenure track or all to act kind of thing. So, I, and, you know, the infrastructure of people collaborating across disciplines seems to me like success. But I've as you were asking that, I thought, okay, what would I like to see? I'd like to see a data journalist coming out of the University of Virginia who understands the history of periodicals and newspapers. I, I would like to, because it seems to me digital humanities actually contributes a little less presentism 
then is the risk, you know, when you're talking about immediate uses of data and data science, you know, we're dealing with cybersecurity, we're dealing with environment, you know, it feels so timely. Well, how about some historical perspective and, and working, if you have that interdisciplinary experience of having taken a course with some crazy person who cares about the Middle Ages, you might realize, oh, the Anthropocene goes back a long time. And there have been people working with, the, you know, the um, parchment to realize, you know, you can study the sheepskin, you know, so it's, there's all kinds of ways that you could improve the data scientist who goes out and works for the New York Times as a person who actually realizes there's a history. So I mean, I, success to me would be hard to hard to say, put a little bow around, but it, but the success would be the production of really smart people who are doing responsible data science. Yeah, I don't think, uh, of course, the humanities does <coughs> nowhere do they speak as <coughs> as a group. It's, it's not like there's a, uh, but since they're so broad, but the the notion of what counts as a uh, grand challenge problem. So success might be we solve a grand challenge problem. Right? So the Quite a few of the sciences have various versions of those grand challenges. So we've so solved that problem with cancer. We've solved that problem, we've had success. And so I, I, uh, I don't think that people have, en have enunciated many things that look like grand challenge problems uh, driving out of the humanities per se. Uh, I would say that, that talking about the, the need for, for data, the degree to which there are many scholars here who are interested in textual materials. Uh, and that there is a, a, a large amount of that kind of textual materials uh, available, and to uh, to have a program by which uh, people would this is going to kind of sound like process again, but uh, we would have the kind of uh, research environment here for humanists to delve into large-scale textual corpus would be I could say that would be a, a, so. Ron's here he's talking about big data store so that the medical data can be in there and you can do cross-study references. Well, the, the notion of, uh, I mean, people point to Google Books and say, well, there's lots of stuff out in Google Books and that's good. And when you look at some of the large-scale projects, you go, oh, well, they just talked about the titles, in fact. They didn't actually get that into it. Uh, but the challenge for a, uh, an English faculty member, bigger challenge even for, shall we say, a Spanish faculty member who wants to go and get a large corpus and be able to collaborate with somebody in data science on that corpus. Yes. There's a huge first step in that for them. Just just the idea of how they're going to be able to get that corpus, and and so that the notion that we might have an infrastructure, and by when I say infrastructure, I want to emphasize there's people always are the crucial part of that. So it's not just that we have some big data stores here and some big number crunchers over here. It's it's the people that know how to actually work that. To have that kind of infrastructure, they would have a, a large scale textual corpus. People could do corpus analysis. Uh, is a very difficult, challenging thing for a lot of the humanities who are coming out of a text textual basis. I might just say, uh, my, what I've just heard, I just probably realized that success for me in five years is I, I think about success in a different way than I do now. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you'd also come out of an area where having those kind of corpus of, of uh, previous studies has been a major issue. I'll just respond to that just real quick and maybe suggest thinking about it in a slightly different way. To, you know, today, as, as uh, the opening speaker said, uh, all research is based on some kind of data, right? And so using tools like AI to do research in the areas, to me, success would be where you have the humanists and the ethicists now commenting on your, your foundational tool sets to make them better and more more compatible with the in, impact their design the impact their design yes. and use from that is that iterative about two yeah, to I to say it's a virtual side yes mm -hmm. the, uh, you know ethicists in i mean uh, english departments are crammed full of people who are actually essentially working on ethics you know uh, and narrative um, which have huge impact on everything we do so. You mentioned virtuous cycle, and I can, I can understand it in that way, but I, when I think about uh, the typical kind of scientific research project, the cycle, there isn't a second iteration of the cycle in which that kind of consideration comes back in to impact the development of that, that you're going to stop halfway through, three year grant, year and a half, we're going to stop and we're going to actually take evaluation of what this uh, interpretive 
reflection on these tools are, and we're going to do something different in the last 18 months. I, I, I've never seen a project that did that. My, my guess that there may be quite a few out there, but, but being able to have the idea that the research cycle of, a, of an individual granting thing has some actual turnaround of that in, in the project would be wonderful. I've actually got one example in my there, whole life. There we go. And it's actually quite, sorry, but just, and it's not, it, it, it's at least by some promise in my own mind, and that is the notion that uh, computation, uh, it was an experiment and you needed computation to interpret it. But that computation then drove how the experiment was conducted and it went around and around like this, uh, more than once. So that doesn't, that doesn't happen to me very often, I have to say. And I would like to interject, because I, that brought it to mind again. When we think about this data in the two worlds, uh, countries that uh, uh, Raph is talking about, I think what when you think on the science side, you need to stop and think a little bit about the endeavor of creating instruments. Okay, let us say when you go out, I mean the super collider, when we've got billions and billions to build that instrument, and if you, if you don't think there was a, there's some intellectual, not computational, intellectual issues about what's going to count as data, what's going to be the given once we spend those several hundred million billion on this thing, what's, what are we going to take as the given? What's, what's the data that comes out of that? And so building instruments in some way is, uh, ha has some analogy in, uh, in trying to think about what uh, digital humanities do. And the sciences sometimes take their instruments as given and, and go from that, but sometimes they're actually building those instruments. What's the intellectual contribution of the instrument builder in that? Right. So Eric, you have a question? Yeah, well, sort of a little more uh, of a challenge going back to your evening comment about starting from the table as a given and then moving forward in terms of data science and, and data analytics and even visual, visualizing those things and so forth. I, I'm actually curious about the sort of flip side of that, the, the opposite direction. Uh, and I believe that we've talked a lot, or you, you talked a lot about text-based corpus as the sort of founding of the notion of humanities, but there's in fact a very large aspect of humanities which is image-oriented. Uh, certainly in my own area in architecture, we have a lot of that, but many, many, many other fields. So what about, or maybe where it's a little more in our area, but computer vision? Mm -hmm. And so the, the idea of what is successful like in five years, perhaps, is adding a new way of redefining what data even means and how do we achieve that within a university that has such a fundamental basis in the humanities. Uh, to be able to redirect and sort of come at that from a very different angle and propose this is a new way of getting it, and we start applying more computer vision based approaches to the analysis of images to be able to generate the data that then gives us, and that's through analysis, not to produce it to construct then later analysis, although that will happen, right. but it's actually redirecting it the opposite. So instead of you know data analysis outcome, it's there was an outcome analysis data. I'll give one little plug to somebody who's speaking at five o'clock today over in Campbell Hall <laughs> is from the University of Padua and he, he wonderful he, work yes he's he's, he's a interesting guy but at five o'clock on Friday well anyway <laughs> Uh, <laughs> on your way to the lawn for trick or treating goes how about anyway his one, reception reception there was, so one of his research things is to go back and look at, at paintings. And he's talking about painting technique, and what he'd like to be able to do is take various models of projections, image projection, and try to say, well, if the painter actually understood it in this way, does that fit what the painting has? And so that's, there's a notion of, a, of taking analysis out of the painting and going that against a model uh, and seeing how, how they correspond. And, and there's an intellectual, an interesting intellectual question in what the painting technique was at that time. And I think that's a, 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 I think that's a very interesting form of that. It, it gets it a little bit like uh, something that's a, a different kind of thing than the normal David But so I, I do have one little point, which is that even the, the fields like history and English that you think of as text-based uh, are now at this point doing a lot with visualizations of data for one thing, but then spatial uh, digital humanities of all kinds. And it's really interesting, the mapping that's going on. And I'm, I'm working on spatial data myself. So, so do you have a question? Do you have a question? Yes. Uh, where you talked a little bit before about infrastructure. Um, and given that this is one of the areas that NEH is willing, has been interested in investing more in, you know, to the point about the lack of robust funding for the yeah. humanities, um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about some of the challenges in 
creating data infrastructure for the humanities and sort of where the where you'd like to see the field go and, and sort of the next goals to reach or obstacles to, to tackle. Well, well thanks. And, and, I, and I, again, this is a place where I think there's commonality across a, a lot of the computation mediated scholarship uh, is that when we think about it from a project point of view, like another NEH grant, an IMLS grant, those are, those are non-trivial amounts of money. So we, we complain about how little there is, but for those projects, it's, a, it's, a, it's very, uh, it's a non-trivial amount of money. Uh, but they're project-oriented. And so the, the notion of how, uh, back in the, the golden days, uh, once you got your NSF grant, uh, as long as you were doing good work, that grant continued. NIH is, this, is very much the same way. You got that huge grant, it continued. The next one, you got another three years, you got another three years, and you could actually be planning things out on a 10-year basis of that kind of funding for that. That is almost non-existent. Uh, certainly non-existent. Humanities is getting rare, rare in the sciences, I think. Uh, but so the, the notion is you get a project and it does something, and then two years later, somebody else wants to do a project that's even related. Where, how, do, how do we have any continuity Absolutely. in that? How do we have any kind of way in which that becomes part of a, <clears throat> sorry for the phrase, a corporate memory becomes part of the institutional uh, infrastructure memory that it can then be built on. I don't, I don't, that would be a very nice thing to be trying to consider. That was a little bit what I was kind of talking to about that technical corpus of if these things were <coughs> accreted into a larger, larger technical corpus that people could then come in and access in different subsets of that. Well, that would be a, a, a major thing. So, so that notion of being able to have something longer than an 18 month, 24 month project <coughs> that just starts and stops and then that's that uh, would be a, a, an interesting way to go. But how, to, how to do that is, is a good question. And more, more faculty fellowships and graduate fellowships that are of different models, so short-term you know, opportunities that would keep sustaining people if they're not getting the external, you know, the very scarce, the less than 20% approval <laughs> right. acceptance rate for sometimes single-digit acceptance mm -hmm. rate for some of these NEH. And I uh, should have correctly identified myself. Jack, I'm in the federal relations. It's all very useful for me to hear. Yeah. Oh, very good. Thanks for being here. We still have time, so if there are other questions. Um, so this is a follow-up on uh, questions about infrastructure and... And who are you? Oh, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm Randy Mapp. I work with Ron under Ron and the VBIT, and I also direct the um, graduate DH certificate. So, um, my question is an opportunity for you all to talk more about the relationship between infrastructure and graduate and undergraduate education. Um, and I'll just stop right there. Well, I'll start because uh, one of the specialties of the Scholars Lab is the graduate fellowships um, that we've had since 2006. Um, the Praxis Fellowship is six students from any discipline, including yours. Um, it, it funds them for a certain amount of teaching release that keeps their funding constant with their benefits and the six of them, and we found that this is the optimal size, work on a, on a project together and they get a lot of coding training. Um, two, two or more digital humanities dissertation fellows a year. These things are not cheap and we won't necessarily always have the, have the uh, funding, but that's one of the things we're really proud of. But what I'd like to see is much more undergraduate involvement in, undergraduate, in research. Uh, I'm currently working with a couple of first year students. There's this program that pays them if they're eligible for financial aid. Essentially, it's not, they're not helping my project for my, very, that much. I mean, I'm learning from teaching with them, but they're getting just their hands on working on some research. Um, on the Ann Spencer House and Museum, because I have a whole sideline in being interested in cultural heritage sites and, anyway, um, African American culture in Lynchburg. I would love to see the graduate students getting uh, postdoctoral positions to help mentor and teach undergraduates. So we get much more of a kind of structure of a whole team of people. And it's the kind of thing that Worthy was basically saying. We need more people around who can work on each other's projects, but we also can foster undergraduate education through this sort of multi-tiered faculty, graduate student, and staff um, community. 
And it doesn't all have to be on the, you know, the great English novel, which is what these things tend to get. You know, they tend to get really big in topic when you have a lot of people involved. But we could have many sub-projects with a large team. Uh, the history of One slavery at the University of Virginia could be a large team. Mm -hmm. Sorry? So, Joy Tan's facilities So, I'm hearing something here about the infrastructure and the products of academic scholarship is very kind of make a product. Uh, granted, it's make a product. And something we heard in the keynote earlier about 26% of those, can you actually get the data and the methods back out of and reproduce them? Where is the infrastructure for hosting the, the sausage making? Now, especially now that sausage making is data and black box and AI and it's completely dehumanized sausage making. It's not, it's not the text is the data and I go block myself in the tower and I come out with a product. Mm -hmm. It's really, you can't figure out what happened in between the steps. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, the kind of open, exchangeable way of storing mm -hmm. and like that piece that's, that's missing. So I'll, I'll abuse you by saying that I would not, like to remind you, the instructor to me always includes people. And so when you say, well, uh, yeah, we've got that AI tool available, so maybe it's on an ITS store, you can download it and apply it or something. Having the people that, that go along with that is, is always crucial. Uh, and I think that kind of gets back to the, the question there. But, but, but trying to actually uh, keep track of the sausage making is, is a, yet another problem here. I don't, I don't think the sciences have a good way of doing it either. Uh, uh, we do pretty well compared to a lot of what <laughs> well, I mean, there, there really is a lot of documentation and our GitHub repos well, are just right you're, there. You're talking about your humanity. Your yeah, humanity I, know. Problem. I said that yeah. <laughs> sciences don't do well. Sorry, no, I so, know, but, but, I'm, but I'm just, yeah, no, you said either. Yeah, okay. Sorry. I think we've run out of time. Uh, Sorry. That's all right. That's good. It's been very productive. I wanted us all to thank our panelists. who have been excellent. Thank you.